Okay, so we are live now. So good morning, PJ Devru, and uh, as we love to call you PJ, I, I address you more as PJ, but officially would like to address you as Dr. Philip J. Devru. Uh, so thank you for joining our show. We call it the Ask the Expert Show, and it's brought to you by Newman Health. Uh, Newman Health, just to give a quick introduction, is a digital health company. We were founded in 2020. And we focus on uh, helping people who have chronic health conditions to recover at home. And we do this virtually. And uh, we are proud to call ourselves as the largest digital health uh, providers in the field of cardiac rehabilitation. And uh, so we started the show uh, called Ask the Expert with the intention to bring uh, new information or existing information or talk about evidence-based practices and bring it from people who have both the experience and the authority to talk about it. So quickly for all our benefits of our listeners who are either connected live now or will be seeing this recording later on, uh, Dr. Philip J. Devru, uh, who is, uh, is Dr. Devru is the world-renowned cardiologist and he works at the Hamilton General Hospital in, in, uh, at Hamilton in, in Canada. And as we all know, uh, HHS or Hamilton Health Sciences is one of the top five you know, renowned hospitals of the world. And it's got its reputation because of not only of its clinical services, but also because of its research contribution. And Dr. Devru uh, not, does not just practice cardiology, but has been extensively working in the field of research and also a big contributor to evidence based and, and guidelines writing. And his focus for the last, I think, his career has been dedicated to perioperative cardiovascular care. So, so Dr. Devo, thank you for joining us this on, on this day. And I'm sure it's quite an early day for you because your clocks have turned back an hour. But thank you again for you know being on this show. Uh, so, Dr. David, to, to just begin the whole show, uh, can you just briefly tell us about why you chose to become a cardiologist? And after you became a cardiologist, why did you focus on perioperative care? Well, first thing is, um, thank you so much, Alvin, for having me uh, join your podcast here today. And, and um, it's a great privilege. And I'm very grateful for the long uh, collaboration we've had and all of the time I've also had to spend in India and with uh, you and many other people. Um, so when I went to, I'm from Cape Breton Island, which is a very small rural part of Canada. And um, when I went to medical school, I definitely, my goal was to go back to Cape Breton and be a real doctor. And um, I'd read this book as a kid growing up about this Cape Breton doctor who would talk about, you know, taking his horse across the ice and doing an appendectomy on someone's kitchen table and being paid with chickens. And, and you know, where I grew up, which is a smaller community, the doctor had a very different relationship with the community. Um, you typically delivered people and you took care of them right through till, you know, their older ages. And um, that was my vision of what I wanted to do. And mm -hmm. on the first day, I should also mention that I went through my undergrad um, on a military scholarship. So between undergrad and medical school, I had to serve uh, three years in the military to pay back service. And while I was um, doing that, I'd really decided that I wanted to do medicine. So I wrote away to all the medical schools and I learned about McMaster University at that time for the first time. And at the time I was reading a lot about Edward de Bono, Tony Bazan, who were at the forefront of problem-based learning, lateral thinking, and that's the model that McMaster University was using. And even though my undergrad, I sort of figured out how to do well, but I didn't really think it taught me how to learn. I really, you know, when I read about McMaster, I said, I really want to come here. And so I applied, I was lucky I get in. And I remember the very first day you have a lecture from the Dean, and then you go to these tutorial groups. You're typically with groups of six students and you start learning on topics and our first rotation was cardiovascular respiratory and mm -hmm. I remember the tutor walked in and she introduced herself and she looked at the list of students and she said who is pj devro and i thought to myself oh my god they've screwed up the admissions process and um, i said i am and i said why and she said well she said um 
you have been assigned a very famous student advisor. And I said, oh, who's that? She said, well, it's David Sackett. And I then oh, asked okay. the unaskable question of who's he? And she <laughs> He's a world famous clinical epidemiologist. And my first thought was, I'm going to be a real doctor and go back to Cape Breton. I got to get rid of this guy and get myself a real doctor who's a supervisor. And uh, at, at anyways, when I realized I was still in medical school, at the end of uh, the tutorial, they took us back to our home room and there'd be a letter from Dave in my mailbox saying, call my secretary. We're going out to dinner tomorrow night. And I would meet this character who was sort of bigger than life sort of character. But he opened my eyes to research is something that I was not remotely considering and just was very appealing to me um, because I quickly discerned that even in a busy clinical practice, maybe I could affect during the course of my career, truly the lives of maybe, you know, 10,000 patients, you know, who knows, but not, not a big number, but what, Dave exposed me to was the possibility that we could do research and influence the care of potentially millions of patients. Um, right. And that's what then appealed to me. So then I shifted my focus to wanting to be a real doctor, but also a clinician, you know, researcher. And so when I then from McMaster, I went to Calgary to do my internal medicine. And when I was there, I, my plan was to do general internal medicine. But when I was there, when I did cardiology, was so appealing was at that time it was the area that we had compared to most areas of medicine which is so much better evidence and that mm -hmm. very much appealed to me to being able to be more you know clear about these are things we can do that actually will improve outcomes and i got turned on to that but at the same time i was a bit nervous because i knew i wanted to do research and i didn't want to go where everyone was i wanted to go where there was still a lot of unknown and help to really chart new new territory and cover new terrain. And so I ended up doing an elective with Alan Detsky, who was in Toronto, who was one of these sort of original people doing some research in perioperative cardiovascular care. And he developed what was called the Detsky Index for predicting perioperative vascular complications. And Alan Detsky is also a, a total character and a larger than life sort of individual. And I really discerned when I did that elective that it became obvious to me that this was a huge area because lots of people have surgery. It was a very mm -hmm. fascinating laboratory because in contrast to a lot of cardiology where we're sort of giving drugs and then we're waiting to see what happens the next two to three to five years when a stressful event happens with surgery, we know a stressful event is about to happen in the next you know 24 hours. And it's a very wow. unique laboratory that creates inflammation that activates your, your stress response system it activates your coagulation system and creates the perfect milieu for vascular complications. And also I recognize that it was differentially growing in the elderly and um, we didn't really know much about, you know, how to even ideally predict these events, how to prevent these events, how to better identify these events and how to manage these events. And that's what got me interested in it. And then I just did a initial study and it just went from there, but that was, how I ended up getting interested in the cardiology and then specifically into vascular risk around the time of surgery. Yeah, that was a very interesting story, PJ. And I think it's, uh, I, I, I completely agree with your assumption of uh, Dave Sackett and I had the opportunity to, you know, meet him and also, you know, interact with him. You know, definitely he's a larger than life character and he influences anyone. So I should kind of admit here that, you know, PJ Devra is also my mentor, not only just a friend of mine and, you know, reason why I do research also. So PJ, I think one of the important elements that you kind of mentioned here is that things were so unknown when it comes to perioperative vascular events. And this is like somebody goes in for a surgery, but they have a, a condition which is not related to the surgery. And so just can you throw some light on your discovery? You know, you did the largest cohort study called the Vision and you followed up 40,000 patients and I was quite, uh, you know, uh, happy to be a part of that whole uh, journey of yours. And you coined the term MINS. So can you just kind of give our audience a little insight about how you went about finding that health condition, which was practically at that point in time, nobody even bothered to look at. 
and I guess it was your finding. So can you just throw some light on that? Well, I'm going to tell you that, but there's a story to how we even got to that. So when I decided I really wanted to do research, so after Calgary, I went to Dalhousie University in Nova Scotia, I did cardiology. When I was there, um, I really then very clearly decided, okay, I'm, I'm going to do this. And I then organized and uh, met Salim Youssef, Gordon Guyatt, and I organized to come back to McMaster University and do my master's. And then I switched into a PhD. But when I was coming here, I, you know, spent a lot of time talking to Salim and Gordon. And I said, I really want to develop this area. And at the time, there was a single publication in the New England Journal of Medicine of 112 patients randomized to a beta blocker or placebo. And it said that there was like 100% reduction in death and there was like an 80% reduction in heart attacks if you gave patients beta blockers. Very small trial, unblinded with this too good to be true result. But the reality was people wanted to believe it and guidelines were then written saying people should get beta blockers who are having non-cardiac surgery. And you got to put mm. this in the context that at that time, there would have been like 200 million adults having major non-cardiac surgery on an annual basis. So huge patient population that people were affecting. So when I came to Hamilton, I wrote the protocol for the POISE trial, POISE 1 trial, which would be our first big trial, which tested a beta blocker versus placebo. And um, that's where we really started getting into this. But it was a patient that I saw locally in the POISE trial that led to vision, that led to the concept of myocardial injury after non-cardiac surgery MINS. And so one day I was on call in the CCU and there was a patient who was randomized in the POISE trial. Now, this patient get in the POISE trial because of risk factors. This patient had no known vascular disease. The patient was like a 65 year old gentleman who was this business executive, type A personality. And I get a call while I'm rounding in the CCU from one of my study nurses saying, you know, this guy who had surgery two days ago, his troponin is substantially elevated. Um, and I said, okay, well, I said, get an ECG. And I said, I'll be down to see him as soon as I'm done rounding in the CCU. So I come and see this gentleman. And this gentleman has deep inverted T waves, well in T waves across his anterior leads. And he's got a very high elevated troponin. Now, mm -hmm. I've done my internal medicine training, cardiology training, and I'm now a year on staff in cardiology. And I've seen a lot of heart attacks by this point. There's no doubt in my mind this guy has had or is having a heart attack. But when I tell this guy, I said, look, you know, you're having this heart attack and or you've had this heart attack and I'm going to take you to the cardiac care unit. I'm going to start some medication. And depending how things go in the next 24 hours, we'll determine whether I need further testing, further interventions, further therapy. And this patient was irate with me. Like he, I think he questioned, I didn't have any gray hair at this time. And I think he wondered if I actually went to medical school. He said, what are you talking about? He said, I'm not having chest pain. He said, I've never had chest pain. And it was interesting in looking at him. It's true that by this point, I'd seen a lot of heart attacks. This guy did look different, but there was no doubt in my mind. You do not get this dramatic and elevated troponin with that ECG. And there's not a heart attack, but it's true. He didn't have any chest discomfort. And so, I then start looking through his chart and what I recognize is that this guy's getting high dose narcotics to mass surgical discomfort. And one of the things that I was immediately drawn to is that when I started my internal medicine training, it was just at the mm -hmm. forefront of, we were using thrombolytics to treat myocardial infarction and the randomized control trials were just starting to happen regarding going directly to the angio suite versus thrombolytics. And yes. I remember so clearly that when we would treat people with lytics, most people's pain would not resolve for an hour or more. And mm -hmm. you'd have patients having massive heart attacks and you'd be putting nitro into them and you might get a bit of relief. Usually the pain would never go away, but if you gave patients narcotics, the pain would disappear. And the mm. concern always was, is that you didn't get rid of ischemia, you masked ischemia. <laughs> Yeah. And so it was this patient's case that made me wonder, and this patient would want to have an angiogram and have a tight um, proximal left anterior descending um, lesion and have an intervention. He would do okay. But 
I remember looking at this guy thinking, well, how often does this happen? Um, yes, this guy looked different. And he, because everyone is getting narcotics during the period of time, or the vast majority of people are getting narcotics after surgery during the period of time when they're vulnerable to have myocardial infarction, could there be a lot more events that are happening? And if you don't measure troponins, you'll miss these events. And that's what led to us doing the vision study. And so mm. when I mentioned, um, and India played a very large role in it, but we had 28 centers in 14 countries that um, included a representative sample of patients age 45 or greater who had inpatient non-cardiac surgery. And all these patients, we measured the same troponin. And what we were able to identify is that in the patients who had elevated troponins after non-cardiac surgery, mm -hmm. did not have any chest discomfort, no ischemic symptoms, and also didn't have any identified ECG changes, but had no any kind of findings that would suggest a non-ischemic etiology like sepsis, pulmonary embolism, chronically elevated troponin, that those patients who we believed had ischemic etiologies for their troponin elevation, but had no other factors to allow you to make the diagnosis of myocardial infarction, that those events dramatically changed patients' prognosis. They had over a threefold increase in the probability they would die in a 30-day period compared if they didn't have that event. In other words, because patients don't complain of chest discomfort or shortness of breath after surgery, if they're having myocardial injury, that is not a benign event. Those patients are on a bad trajectory. And it's because of that concept we realized we had to come up with a new concept that was bigger than myocardial infarction because myocardial infarction was going to miss 75% of the events because people wouldn't have symptoms because of narcotics. And some of the Holter data suggests that a lot of people have ECG changes, but you miss them. And the reason mm -hmm. that you miss them is when people are having ischemia, if they don't have symptoms, they don't no. want you to get an ECG saying I'm having symptoms and you're simply doing the ECG the next day when you identify an elevated troponin, but that may be, you know, 10, 12, 24 hours after the ischemic event actually happened. And that's why you frequently miss ECG changes. And so we realized we needed a bigger term to avoid missing these important myocardial injuries. We then coined the term myocardial injury after non-cardiac surgery and then that opened up a whole new big program of research to really understand these events, figure out how we're going to prevent these events, and figure out how we're going to manage these events. Interesting. So just for the benefit of all our listeners, I just want to give them the context here. Ideally, in a non-surgical setting, you'll have somebody who's having a heart attack, suffer a serious chest pain or shortness of breath, or we call angina, and they get rushed to a hospital and somebody quickly checks their ECG, checks their vitals and all that. And in the present setting, we take them straight to an angiogram and then we manage these patients. The same situation is happening in these patients, but there is no signs. These patients are just lying around in the hospital after their surgery. The surgery went off very well and they're just lying around, somebody just monitoring them. They're actually going through the same process that is happening in the non-surgical setting, and nobody's looking for it. So that's the magnanimity of this whole problem. And when we said 75% of these things would have been missed if we had not changed the definition, I just wanted the listeners to you know, grasp that, that difference that we're talking about. And I just want to, you know, to ask you, PJ, to kind of elaborate a little more about when you said why this event is not to be considered as uh, uh, not to be taken lightly. You know, you said this is a serious problem. Yes. And so can you just elaborate a little bit more about why you feel it is it's an extremely serious, kind of more serious than what I talk about in a non-surgical setting? Yeah, so maybe one step before that, but I, I also want to highlight a point. Patients, even though we're focused on complications that can happen in the surgical setting, I want to be clear about a point. Patients have surgery for important reasons. Sometimes it's to cure cancer. Sometimes it's to dramatically improve quality of life, a new hip, a new knee, you know, peripheral arterial disease, something. So 
the I want to be clear in focusing on the complication. I don't want anyone to lose perspective that we are simply identifying complications because we want to figure out how to prevent them and better manage them so people can have surgery for the important reasons that have people have surgery. Yes. Um, but if, but what people also have to realize is that because of the setting of which surgery happens and because of the ubiquitous use of narcotics, it has a tendency in people being post anesthetic, they don't have normal alerts to know that, hey, there's something wrong that I can draw attention of a doctor or a nurse to help me. And that makes mm -hmm. patients vulnerable. When patients have myocardial injury after non-cardiac surgery, it puts them on a very bad trajectory in terms of the probability that they're going to die in a 30-day period or have a major vascular complication. And it's not that it just lasts for 30 days. It persists for at least two years. And to put things into context, when none of us in cardiology or medicine would not suggest that patients who've had a prior heart attack, not in the surgical setting, but just they've had a prior heart attack or they have known peripheral arterial disease or prior bypass surgery, those patients need aggressive medical management because they're at risk of having recurrent events. If you put, so another trial that Alvin um, played an important role in and our group led was called the MANAGE trial. And the MANAGE trial was the first randomized control trial to test a therapy and how to manage MINS. Mm -hmm. What I want to do is I want to focus on the control group in the MANAGE trial, and I want to compare it to a big trial that was looking at the management of patients, nothing to do with surgery, but it had prior heart attacks, peripheral arterial disease, or prior bypass surgery. And that will use the example of the COMPASS trial. So in the mm -hmm. COMPASS trial, which was done, led out of Hamilton by many of my colleagues, and it's a very important trial that is a very important result. But if you look at the control group, which was people essentially getting aspirin in the COMPASS trial, in the COMPASS trial, um, which was much larger than the MANAGE trial, but in the COMPASS trial, they had 23 months of follow-up. And in the MANAGE trial, in our control group, which was mainly getting aspirin, we had only 16 months of follow-up. Now, again, patients in the managed trial had MINS. They had myocardial injury for non-cardiac surgery. The yes. COMPASS trial is people that had prior heart attacks, peripheral arterial disease, prior bypass surgery. Even though the managed trial had a shorter follow-up, hence, if anything, should have had less, you know, less outcomes, the managed trial control group compared to the COMPASS trial has cardiovascular death and myocardial infarction that are two to four times the number of events that happen in the COMPASS trial. The patients mm. who suffer myocardial injury or non-cardiac surgery run a very bad trajectory. And, you know, part of the problem that exists is that because in a lot of places in the world, people didn't recognize this and there isn't a structure in a lot of places in the world where patients are going to be seen by medical specialists and followed up, it's easy to assume people do well when you don't follow them. But the epidemiology doesn't lie. When you follow the patients, what you realize is they don't do well. There's a very high probability of patients having very poor outcomes. So in the managed trial, 16% of patients will end up having a very bad event in a 16-month follow-up that is cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI, stroke, major cardiovascular events. And we need to do a better job. So these events are very important events. Patients are at high risk for bad things to come. In a lot of places in the world, prior to this research, they weren't even screening with troponins to identify these events. And many of these patients weren't being referred and being followed up by specialists in cardiovascular care, medical care, to make sure that they do better. Very interesting. Just to add a point here, uh, you mentioned about Gordon Guide. In fact, Doc, Dr. Gordon Guide was one of our first guests on Ask the Expert right. Show way back in 2020. So you know, I always keep appreciating that part. Uh, just to, uh, just to, uh, why I brought that topic up, one of the things that we discussed at that is that a lot of tiles get into uh, evidence and evidence goes into guidelines. And one of the points that I was talking to Dr. Gordon is to see you know, how much of those guidelines get implemented into practice. And this is where I just want to bring into the point that PJ Debra runs a perioperative care clinic at his hospital. Uh, so could you just throw some light about what made you start 
a perioperative care clinic. And I know it was, uh, I've seen it growing from where it started to now. And even at the last Congress, you were discussing about how the, you know, the man convincing the management to set up something like that is still very challenging. So can you just kind of give us an idea about what a perioperative care team does or a clinic does and you know why why what what are, why do, why do you think about it and what are you doing with that? Yeah. So um, probably 15 years ago, we started the perioperative vascular service, and so any patients that had significant vascular risk, we would be happy to see them pre-op and we'd be happy to see them post-op, or if people developed vascular complications after surgery, we would see those patients and we would manage those events and follow these patients up. But then as we did that, and as we started doing vision and the resu results from vision came out, what we realized is perioperative care is much bigger than just vascular events. Even though my dominant focus is on the vascular events, we realized that you know infection, sepsis, bleeding, pain, um, all you know, renal dysfunction, there's a whole host of things that are happening that are all important. So we made a fundamental decision that, you know, we want to definitely improve the vascular outcomes, but we wanted to also just make surgery safer so that ideally anyone can have surgery. They would not be denied it or not decide against it because of risk, because we were going to figure out how to make it so safe that anyone will be able to undertake these important procedures to get the benefits of why they undergo surgery. So then we evolved the service to being perioperative care. And then we, again, would see people pre-op that had risks for any kind of major complication. And then we, are, then we would do is we would co-manage the patients with the surgeons afterwards in the hospital. But then also what we recognize is that um, more and more patients were gonna go home sooner and sooner because it was endless push in the hospital to get people out of the, out of the, out of the hospital. Most patients after surgery had hemodynamic instability. Most people will come who had vascular risk would come to surgery on, it could be one to six antihypertensive medications or medications that could affect blood, blood pressure. And um, a lot of those patients would not be able to tolerate those medications immediately after surgery. And if they're going home, people feel uncomfortable not to restart the medication. So a lot of times the medications gets piled on. So then this mm -hmm. we just realized that maybe what we have to do is also set up a transitional program into the home setting. And this is where we started getting into virtual care and remote automated monitoring technologies that would allow us to measure patients' vital signs when they went home. And then as COVID hit, we started doing randomized control trials on those types of technology. And that has been a sea change in terms of our program where we ended up getting a big grant that allowed us to build a big lab that brings the nurses and physicians together with great monitoring technology where we can all be seeing the patient virtually, seeing all of their vital signs and manage them together as, as a group. And it's also being set up for all of our research. And that has been a really exciting change. The other thing too that we started to make a shift in is that we should treat the perioperative period not simply as a period where we definitely want to make sure you do well in the surgical setting and that you survive and you get to the end of the surgical period, let's say 30 days. But we also wanted to make sure that at the end of that journey, you were on the right medication for long-term health. We started to realize is there's a lot of older patients who come to surgery who have underlying vascular disease as one example, osteoporosis, another example, who are not on the right medications for long-term health. And so then we also started to transition where a big focus now is to make sure people get onto the right treatment for long-term health. We now, with Sandra Flory, developed a big smoking cessation program, big focus on that for, again, trying to get people to transition during this period into being non-smokers, again, for long-term health. So the program has become much bigger in that it's focused on trying to make surgery safer so that anyone can have it. And at the same time, also using this opportunity as a moment to set people up for long-term health and ensuring that they're on the right therapy for long-term health. Very interesting. And I just want to kind of extend on that same topic uh, for the for the benefit of our listeners here. What, if in your experience and, and from all the research that you did, is there a subset of people who undergo this procedure who are at a higher risk of developing MINS? And is that subset identifiable in your preoperative care? I know, understand you still need to monitor them postoperatively. But is there some indication that you can get when you look at somebody before they get into surgery? 
Yeah. So um, there are a number of things that predict that you're going to be at increased risk of MINS just as you get older. Basically, there's two things that are relevant of whether or not you're going to get MINS. One is the physiological stress associated with the surgery you're about to undergo. And the second thing is whether or not you personally have the substrate that makes you vulnerable to get MINS. In other words, do you have underlying atherosclerotic disease? So if you have underlying atherosclerotic disease and you have a surgery that has a big physiological stress, you're at increased risk. So both the surgery and patient factors matter. All that being said, we've done a lot of research. There's basically four ways that people have focused on trying to predict events. One is through clinical risk indices by getting history. Do you have a history of coronary disease? How old are you? Do you have diabetes? People have looked at their functional capacity. People have looked at non-invasive cardiac testing like MIBI scans as an example, stress tests. And then finally, people have looked at biomarkers. There is no ambiguity that biomarkers are the strongest predictor of who's going to have MINS and major cardiovascular events and even death in the perioperative setting. Um, okay. Antiprobium P is the strongest. Troponin may ultimately be shown to be even more predictive than antiprobium P or to have other advantages because by knowing the preoperative troponin, as soon as I see a postoperative troponin, I know whether or not that value is acute because I now have a reference. Um, mm. the, the challenge that still exists with troponin is that there are many different troponins and we don't yet know the thresholds in the preoperative setting to predict the bad outcomes in the postoperative setting with troponin across a number of the most common troponins that exist. Um, okay. And so more work is needed, but for certain you can predict the events. The thing that most dramatically predicts the events is the biomarkers. nt I would argue at the moment is the strongest biomarker to predict these events. Interesting. So just to you know, clarify for everybody, when I say biomarker, it's just a blood test and you get that blood test done prior to surgery. And most patients go through a blood test, but adding specific biomarkers like nt BNP or a troponin elevate, troponin test uh, can help us to look at the change that happens in the post-operative setting so that you can be better predicting the whole uh, uh, you know, poss possibility of you having a mince. And now coming to the fact of... And Alvin, you... Alvin, Alvin, can I just add one point just to come back yeah. to the case I told you about in the POISE trial where I saw that sort of business yes. executive guy having a heart attack who didn't think I had any idea what I was doing. Yes. Because um, he, you know, he's like, I don't have heart disease and I'm not having chest pain. So another interesting thing about that guy, beside the fact that he was getting narcotics that could mask ischemic symptoms, when I asked the guy, I said, prior to surgery, I said, were you getting episodes of chest pain? And he said, no. But then when I also spoke to him, what became very obvious to me is this guy had hip surgery. This guy mm -hmm. hadn't been active for at least nine months. He had done very little because of the osteoporosis he had in his hip was limiting him from doing any activity. So one of the challenges that exists when you're seeing people before surgery trying to predict bad outcomes, when you solely rely on the history or their functional capacity, part of the problem is, is that often the indication for surgery limits their mobility, be it arthritis, be it cancer, be it vascular disease. So most people don't push themselves enough to get ischemic symptoms. And even though they may have a very serious underlying heart issue, they're just not doing enough stress even to manifest symptoms. And that's mm -hmm. why biomarkers are way more predictive. They can pick up much more subtle, you know, evidence that the heart is not functioning optimally, even when you're not in a stress situation in contrast to symptoms or even functional capacity. Yes, I think that's a very important point. And I think we, I, I, I used to remember during the POIS days, we used to have presentations which tell surgery is like putting somebody who's never run a walked a mile, you know, putting him to a marathon. So you're basically you're pushing him into a stressful situation without really knowing their preparedness for that particular stressful situation. Uh, so, so PJ, I think uh, as we come into the end, I would like to just kind of ask one last question, and then maybe we can summarize. Uh, what is it possible at this point in time when somebody has been detected with mens? Uh, I do understand this research is still evolving, but can you kind of share with us what treatments are most beneficial for these people so that they do not 
suffer from major vascular events after having the mens. Yeah. So for certain, when you identify someone has troponin elevation after surgery, the first thing you want to do is look to see, is there, there's no evidence of a non-ischemic etiology. So there's nothing to suggest the patient's septic, having a pulmonary embolism. It's clearly a dynamic troponin elevation. It's not a chronic elevation. So I'll repeat the measurement if you don't have a preoperative one. If you then decide, okay, based on, you know, what we can see here, this most looks to be um, an ischemic etiology, then what you want to do is to make sure that if there's any physiological stresses, that is, the patient is hypoxic, you want to treat that. If the patient is tachycardic, you want to slow down their heart rate. If the patient is really hypotensive, you want to bring up their blood pressure. So obvious, easy things that you want to correct immediately that will be physiological stresses that will exacerbate the myocardial injury you want to do. We then, um, we have one randomized control trial in this area that shows that an intermediate dose of an anticoagulant is effective in preventing the recurrence of vascular death and major complications in the next subsequent two years after people have MINS. So people should definitely give consideration for dabigatran 110 milligrams BID. We also yeah. have a lot of observational data demonstrating in the perioperative MINS myocardial infarction setting after surgery that aspirin, statins, ACE inhibitors are beneficial. We have mm -hmm. very large randomized control trials that in just general show us in people with atherosclerotic disease, aspirin, statins, ACE inhibitors are extremely effective in preventing events. And even though we don't have randomized control trials in the parapro setting, it is rational until we have that, that you should use those medications because we also have evidence from our coronary CT angiography study that the vast majority of people that have MINS have underlying atherosclerotic disease. And so okay. again, these patients, the observational data is highly probable true. So with our patients, we see the patient acutely. We look to see if there's any correctable physiological stresses at the moment that need correcting. We then, if the patient has not had any significant bleed or anything, we'll be initiating that patient on aspirin. We'll be initiating that patient on statin or titrating the dose up if they're on a statin. And then the next day or two, we'll typically be looking at starting an ACE inhibitor and starting dabigatran when the risk of bleeding looks to be very you know, stable in that patient. And then importantly, we follow these patients, we put them into other studies. We're, we're doing studies right now on risk stratification with uh, coronary CT or, or cardiac PET scanning um, and put them into other trials. So lots to do. Definitely you want to also be assertive about smoking cessation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and good basic secondary therapy. But our research shows that a lot of places around the world, people don't get even good basic secondary prophylactic measures. And they're, it's irrational not to be giving these patients good secondary prophylactic measures. Yes. So that's very, very useful. And I think just want to summarize this for everybody's point. Most important point is myocardial injury after non-cardiac surgery is in fact happening. And I guess even though people are only learning about it, I think what the clear message that we need to give out from today's talk is that it is a real event and it does happen in patients who are at risk. The sad part is we still are evolving and understanding that particular risk. So it's better to look for it in everybody. And when you say everybody, it's about a certain category of people who are undergoing necessary surgery which is absolutely necessary. It could be getting a new hip, getting a new knee, or undergoing some cancer surgery or some important surgery in their life. But to look for this particular events as in the perioperative setting. And very important that you use biomarkers and not just rely on history where the patient can kind of give you a very clean chit of not smoking, not having any heart disease, but still something from a biomarker basis you'll be able to pick up and once you find it it is important to stick to the basics at least to give them the basic secondary therapies and maybe consider using dabigatran which has got a very pretty good strong evidence in the whole care but i think the bottom line in this whole thing is that there is a need for a dedicated uh, service from a perioperative care perspective, because the volumes of people who undergo surgery is so much. I think when, when you did vision and points, it was 200 million. I'm sure now it's at about 330 to 340 million. And a lot of patients are undergoing surgery with a very shortened period of stay in the hospital. 
and you know there's, there's still the surgery is happening but the stay in the hospital is lesser which means the window that you get to actually look for this is also shortening so i think that's why this this message is very important and so thank you pj for actually giving this these insights and i would like you to kind of give some closing remarks for our audience both who are listening as well as people who will you know look at this video down the line yeah well first again thank you very much alan for allowing me to be part of your um podcast here today and um just to remind people again people have surgery for very important reasons we want to find a way to make surgery so safe that anyone can have surgery and derive the benefits from surgery that there are many. Um, there are a number of complications on the vascular side, which are important. Many of them are vulnerable to be missed because people are getting narcotics and they don't typically have, they don't have typical symptoms. The good news is with modern biomarkers that are cheap tests, we can monitor for these events and we have management plans for these events to make sure that people do well. Because the last thing we want to do is have someone being cured of cancer or someone getting a new lease on life with a new knee who then has a myocardial injury that no one knows about and no one does anything and the patient ends up dying three or six months later. We don't want to see that happen. And so the good news is um, it's a bit like hypertension. Most people don't feel symptoms. And for a long time, Many people didn't think we should treat hypertension. Many people thought it was a bad idea, it was gonna decrease cerebral perfusion. Mm -hmm. We eventually get to a place where epidemiology and clinical trials start to say, it's a bad idea to be ignoring this. It's a bad idea not to treat this. And so I think the same thing has happened in this setting. Surgery is a very unique setting um, and we are you know, focused on how do we keep making this safer? And um, I believe that through the monitoring for myocardial injury, and the appropriate management of this is one step in the right direction of making surgery safer for everyone. Thank you so much, PJ, and I wish you all the best for all the future research that you will continue to do and throw more evidence on this matter. We look forward to more of your publications and your guidelines coming out and change of practice. And we also look forward to seeing you in India if you are going to happen to be here very soon. And it was wonderful talking to you as always and uh, thank you and have a great day ahead as well as a good weekend you too take care and i hope to see you in india before too long take care bye bye bye